Zephaniah this morning. We completed last week the origin section of Zephaniah. We talked about the author. We talked about the, the name as far as where uh, what Zephaniah means. And we talked about the date. Uh, the date, of course, being, if I have my uh, clicker working, uh, we ended with that last week. The date being somewhere in here between 630 and 621 BC, which would put us just in before the Judean captivity, but around the reign of Josiah, but around the beginning, oh, wow, sorry, around uh, probably the middle of the reign of Josiah, but before the religious reforms that we see in the book of 2 Kings, when Josiah finds the book of the law and he gets the people again to obey the commandments of the Lord. So that will bring us to the purpose. And of course, there are three sections we always talk about in these overviews. We talk about the historical purpose, the doctrinal purpose, and how this book relates to Jesus Christ. Um, how this book relates to Jesus Christ. And so for our historical purpose, uh, Really, Dave gives us a question here. According to Zephaniah, how had God's covenant people historically responded to God's judgments? Anyone got any ideas before we read Zephaniah 3, 6, and 7? How had they historically responded? What do, what do usually happen? When we read books like Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. Sometimes they, just for a short time, they would repent, but then they would just fall back into it. Yeah. And as far as we, we saw that in our Judges cycle, or like I saw in our Judges book, the cycle of repentance, renewal, and then falling back into sin. And we see that in our day, and that, that is the pattern that we fall into. We get so low, so bad, that we turn to try to get out of that. And invariably, people turn to religion. Now, some people turn to false religion, but we turn to religion. Well, in the case of God's covenant people, he would send a prophet, they would bring them back, and, and uh, they would generally come back, but only for a short time. And once that time was over, then they would go back and God would judge them again. Let's read Zephaniah 3, verses 6 and 7. And we'll get uh, uh, Tammy to do that. I have cut off nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I have made their streets desolate with none passing by. Their cities are destroyed. There is no one, no inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction so that her dwelling would not be cut off despite everything for which I punished her. But they rose early and corrupted all their deeds. And of, course, and, and, and of course, God in this last judgment was not wanting to send Judah off into captivity. I really do think that. God was going to do it because Israel wouldn't repent, or Judah in this case wouldn't repent. But is never God's design just to sit there, oh, I'm itching to send these people off into captivity, or I want to punish these people. That's the view that a lot of people get from God, is that he is just sitting on the edge of his seat, so as it were, just wanting to press his thumb and destroy us. Yet that's not the picture that the Bible gives of God. John 3, 16 is, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God will not accept sin. We need to realize that. He will not accept sin. But he is not wanting to punish us. Parents don't want to punish their children. That's, that's always the way it is. Or at least that should be the way it is. Parents should not be just sitting there going, Oh, good, I get to, I get to punish Johnny or Sally today. 
uh, that, that, that makes a great day for me. Now, it's usually a pretty bad day when your children are acting out. You're having to deal with them uh, because you have so many other problems in the day that you have as well. Well, God is not wanting, is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God sent these prophets to warn Judah of impending judgment. But when he sent Jonah to Nineveh, what did, what was the reaction of Nineveh? They repented. They repented. What did God do then? He relented. He relented from what he said. He sent Jonah, surely 40 days from now, this city will be destroyed. But God relented from what he had said because Nineveh repented. Now, eventually, Nineveh was going to be destroyed because they went off, and did, uh, went off into sin again. They would be destroyed in Zephaniah's time. Uh, it would be Nebuchadnezzar that would destroy Assyria before he came and destroyed Judah. Did you have something earlier? Yeah, uh, God is so merciful and his heart ached when he had said, Oh, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oh, I long to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, as parents too, you're so good when your kids do things. And we as parents care for our kids far more God, mm -hmm. who just long for them to do the right things and, you know, to save them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the point. We, God, we, we receive more mercy from God, much, much more mercy from God than we ever deserve. Uh, think about it this way. How many times do we sin and how many times will God forgive us? Every time, if we repent. Every time. If you think about our lives, if someone sins against you, how hard is it to forgive them? It's hard. Hard, depending not on what the they've time. done to you. Not, yeah. not all the time, but it's difficult. Now, all right, that same person sins against you twice. It's even harder. Hard. Three times. A hundred times. A thousand times. It gets harder every time. You would, from our perspective, you would say, how could you forgive that person five, six, seven, eight, whatever it is, they keep sending at you, how could you forgive them? And yet, if they repent, that's what the scriptures say we need to do, and we have to do, because God does that for us. Jesus said it in Matthew 6, if you will not forgive those who trespass against you, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you of your trespasses. So we need to remember God is a merciful God, but he is also a God that will judge us when we sin. I was, I was just thinking that it's good for us not to lose the fear of his justice. Oh, yeah. Because he's just and holy. He can't do anything no. else. If we, if we refuse to repent, you know, in, in human terms, I'm sorry, but... Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. No. Uh, that's true. And, and God demands true repentance, not just uh, uh, not, not just a repentance that is just mere words, because a child can do that. Oh, I'm sorry, and they just don't... They know the words, because you taught them the words, but it's only until they're older that they really understand what those words mean. That, that, that really does require them to be sorry, not just to say the words. Those words have no meaning if there is no meaning behind them. Uh, Cal? Well, I hear many times people say, well, you know what, you need to teach them a lesson. You need to teach them a lesson. And I, I'm so insistent, you need to teach them a lesson. How is that going to help if you're so bent out of shape trying to teach somebody a lesson when we could fall too? Mm -hmm. I hear that all the time, and I don't like that. I just don't like to be God, to teach people a lesson. Well, as far so, as as far as when it comes, when you usually say that, we're, we're talking about vengeance more than anything. Like as far as some people need to be corrected, they need to be taught what they do need to do, but usually when we say that, they need to be taught a lesson, we're, we're talking about vengeance. And we need to, you need to take vengeance on them. No, you don't. In fact, that's not your place. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. 
If, if, if justice isn't done on this earth, it will be done, even if we have to wait for it. Uh, and so Zephaniah, though, also, I would like us to turn to Zephaniah 2. Uh, I'm going to read this just because it is, it is a longer reading, uh, and I, I would like to get through this section. But Zephaniah also points through to specific judgments of God. Not only does he generally talk about God's judgment, he says, he, he points it out to specific nations that he is going to judge them. In Zephaniah 2, beginning verse 4, For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon desolate. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the sea coast, to the nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you. O Canaan, land of the Philistines, I will destroy you. There shall be no inhabitant. The sea coast shall be pastures with shelters for shepherds and folds for flocks. The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed their flocks there. In the house of Ashkelon they shall lie down at evening. For the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the insults of the people of Ammon, which they have, appro which they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the, go the God of Israel, Oh, sorry, so says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Surely Moab shall be like Sodom, and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits, and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall plunder them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. They shall have their pride, and they shall have for their pride, because they have reproached uh, and made arrogant threats against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome for them. He will reduce them to nothing. All, uh, he will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. People shall worship him, each one from his place, indeed, all the shores of the nations. You Ethiopians also, you shall be slain by my sword. And he will stretch out his hand against the north, destroy Assyria, and make Nineveh a desolation as dry as the wilderness. The herd shall lie down in her midst. Every beast of the nation, both the pelican and the bittern, shall lodge on the capitals of her pillars. Their boy shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be at the threshold. For he will lay bare the cedar work. Just like he is in other books, other prophets, uh, <clears throat> some of the other major and minor prophets, God makes specific judgments against specific people. And these, these judgments came to pass. At the time that Zephaniah spoke this, Assyria was the major power. Babylonia, Babylon, was coming up, but it was not the major power. Sort of like China and the United States today. The United States still is the most powerful nation on the planet. But China's getting there. And China will probably, almost certainly, overtake the United States one day. In just, just by their sheer number of people. But their power is growing and growing. and, and we forget India is sitting there too, and their power is growing and growing uh, as well. But China will soon overtake the United States. Unthinkable 25 years ago that, that someone would be able to catch the United States in military might and economic power. But it happens. Well, Assyria was the major power. It, Nineveh was the major power, and yet Babylonia was going to destroy it. Nebuchadnezzar was going to destroy it, just as God said here in Zephaniah. Same with Gaza, the same with the Philistines. When Nebuchadnezzar came into Judah, everything was destroyed. Everything. Not one, one people didn't remain under his power. That God spoke these things and it came to pass... Is, is testament to, to the accuracy of the scriptures and the inspiration of the scriptures. Because that uh, even just maybe you come along and say, well, yeah, he could predict the Philistines. They're not a great people. The Moabites and the Ammonites, they're, they're not a powerful people. But Assyria coming along and, and, him, and him coming along and saying about Assyria, that wouldn't, wouldn't have been well to be predicted. Uh, to come along, uh, to come along and say that early, as as it was here, would have been hard to predict, as Assyria was so powerful. Uh, and so, lest we forget, though, 
God, yes, there is judgment here. Zephaniah 3, which we won't read because we'll read it a little bit later. Zephaniah 3, verses 8 through 20, does talk about a remnant of people who will return. God did not forget his promise to Abraham. He did not forget his promise to Jacob and Judah and David that the Messiah would come. He didn't forget his prophecies that he prophesied in Isaiah and Micah and all the other Old Testament books. Judah would return, but God would judge them first. Anything else before we move on? I forgot to, I forgot to put up here. This is the map, by the way, of the time of when the fall of Israel. That's Assyria, right up here. Of course, this would be Israel. Uh, the northern tribes, but just for our maps, that's where we are. So let's move to the doctrinal purpose. Why did, what, what, what message can we really get from the book of Zephaniah? Zephaniah is intended to teach that in spite of how things may appear, God is truly in control of all things, and it is well within his power to punish the wicked. So, we're going to get a couple of verses. How would the judgments announced by Zephaniah correct the thinking of the inhabitants of Judah? Uh, Bill, you want to get Zephaniah 1, 12, and 13, and then Kala, verses 14 through 17 in the same chapter. Uh, 12 and 13, uh, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. Therefore their good shall become booty, and their houses a desolation. They shall build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. Yeah. Verse 14. Near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. It is the warrior, it is the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of des destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood will be poured out like, like dust and their, and their flesh like dung. What is the attitude of Judah at this time? If you, were to, if, you were to, if you were to describe their attitude in one word, what word might you use? That's a couple words, but I mean, what word might you use? Well, verse 12 says complacency. Yeah. What does that word mean, complacency? Content with the way they are? Yeah. I guess. Uh, the content, yeah, we could get that a little bit. Anything else to go with it? You're complacent. Would you say wrong and strong? No. I know. Yeah, well, uh, I might not go with a little bit of that. Comfortable. Comfortable. Really not caring. Uh, like as far as everything's going along as it is, don't rock the boat. Uh, like as far as if we're complacent, we're not really want, we're, we're not really thinking we're that bad. We're not trying to get better. Like a person who's complacent at their job is not wanting anything to change. They think they're going along well, and they're not trying to get better. And they they, they don't think they think their boss is okay with them. Well, what do what does Judah think God is going to do? According to verse uh, 12. Well, I won't even bother. He's not even worried about it. Yeah. Just leave him alone. Yeah. He's going to do nothing. He's not going to do good. He's not going to do evil. He's just going to be there. 
What does God say? Wrong, no. <laughs> yeah, wrong. Wrong. First of all, you're not as good as you think you are. You are not as uh, you're not righteous. Uh, and now at this time, remember Josiah had not yet reformed the 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 uh, worship of Israel. They were still worshiping idols. Don't think you're righteous just because I haven't destroyed you yet. A lot of times people think, well, God hasn't judged us, so we must be right. That's not true. Just because we might be blessed with physical blessings doesn't mean God is sitting there saying, yeah, you're right. We, if we get into that attitude, we can lull ourselves into a false sense of security. God blesses, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Rain falls on the righteous and the wicked. You take a look at the wicked of this world, they seem pretty blessed by God. But with physical blessings. They don't have any spiritual blessings. They have physical blessings. But they were wicked. And they are wicked. And so Judah was the same way. God was going to bring them down. Their goods shall become booty. Their houses, desolations. They will build houses, but not live in them. They're not going to live in them. They will plant vineyards, but they won't drink of the wine in the vineyards. In other words, they're going to be all of their wealth they're not going to get to enjoy. Someone else will. Because they're going to be taken off into captivity. And so, God is in control of all things. Did you have something to go? Well, I was just thinking that there was a time, you know, when all these natural disasters happened, bad things. There was a time that even people that don't believe in God would say, well, you know, we pray for us. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've noticed in the last year, that doesn't even happen anymore. <laughs> Man's in control. Man's going to straighten out mm -hmm. all these climatic problems. Like, you know, it's just interesting how we think as humans. And sometimes our pride can get in the way and we think we can control nature. Whereas, uh, I always say, let's not go out and destroy nature. No. But, at the same time, let's not think that just because of our doing that we can somehow move the mountains. Uh, because, my dad always used to say, God always has a way of seemingly protecting this earth, and it usually is through natural disasters. There, there was a warming trend in the, in the I forget which which decade it was, but then a volcano erupted and we cooled down again because uh, because the ash clouds blocked out the sun for a little bit, or at least didn't completely block it out, but it certainly helped it. And God always seems to have a way. God's in control. Mankind can't cause it to rain, can't cause the clouds to go disappear. We can't even predict the weather two days out. Uh, yesterday it was supposed to rain all day. Sunshine was out at 2 p.m. Uh, had I known the sunshine was going to be out at 2 p.m., I would have gone out. I would have planned to go out in the afternoon instead of this afternoon to, to do our flyer uh, handouts. But it was supposed to rain until 6, 7 o'clock. I heard that at midnight when I was coming home on Friday. It was supposed to rain till about 7.30. It rained till 2. Now, it did get dark for about an hour at 4 o'clock. But after that, like as far as we can't predict the weather. So what makes us think we can change the weather so drastically? Uh, and so that is, that is a good point. The book teaches us, though, that it's also well within God's power to triumph over false gods. Of course, these false gods can do nothing. Elijah comes to mind as the, uh, as the one who is mocking the gods. Oh, you're perhaps, perhaps your God is on vacation. Perhaps he's asleep. Perhaps he's going off doing his business someplace else. Elijah was mocking those gods because those gods were nothing. They were absolutely nothing. And yet, and yet, people worshipped them. 
God was going to be able to triumph. He was going to judge not only his people, but he was going to judge the Gentiles. Well, why was it righteous for God to be able to judge the Gentiles? We understand Israel. Israel broke the covenant that they had with God. Why was it righteous for God to judge the Gentile peoples as well? What does that mean, maybe, about the Gentiles? Well, they had a law themselves from him. Yeah. And yet they, they refused to, to obey that. That, that. That's Paul's message in the book of Romans. Mm. Where there is no law, there is no sin. In Romans chapter 1, it says that they should have known God. But they did not worship him as God, but instead chose to worship the creature. And God let them go. However, that means doesn't mean God didn't hold them responsible for what things that they should have known. Because the things that they knew were right and didn't do them caused them to sin. If you know it's right, to, it's wrong to steal, yet you steal anyway, you've sinned. <clears throat> now, if you never knew it was wrong to steal, like as far as if you didn't have the capacity to know what was wrong to steal, even though technically you might say that's theft, it's not <clears throat> sin. You, you have a little child, and he comes up, finds, uh, finds money sitting in someone else's chair, like maybe a three, four-year-old. Three, four-year-olds take whatever they want. Like as far as maybe I dropped a quarter or a dollar or something. I didn't know I dropped it. And the child's just gonna come up and take it. An adult would come along and say, well, who was sitting there? It's most likely their money. I'm gonna go give it back to them. Now, and But if no one claims it, then we understand in our life that no one's gonna claim some money, that it's not wrong for us to, uh, uh, to take it, but it, but if we know whose it is, we need to return it. If we can find out whose it is, we can return. We need to return it. Child didn't sin by taking the dollar, the two dollars, whatever I left on my seat. Child needs to be taught. No, you don't do that. It's not yours. And so, and so. Uh, the child doesn't have the capacity to know right and wrong. That's why God doesn't hold them responsible. But the child's going to grow up, and they're going to know the difference. And eventually God will hold them responsible for the things that he has told them. Israel and Judah broke a covenant there, the law of Moses, that God gave them. The Gentiles broke the law that God gave them, which is basically the law of the patriarchs. It's, it's more of a moral law. They worshipped idols. God would hold them responsible for that because it was possible to know who the true God was. We see bits and pieces in the Old Testament of the Gentiles knowing, certain Gentiles knowing about God. Naaman knew about the true God of heaven because of the miracle that was done to him as far as the miracle he experienced. He knew of the true God. Nebuchadnezzar knew of the true God of heaven. Cyrus, uh, uh, sorry, Darius knew of the true God of heaven. We see certain Gentiles throughout the Old Testament knowing about God, worshiping God correctly. However, they were not under the covenant of Moses. They would be saved if they were saved under God's law of them. And so, uh, God is thoroughly righteous to judge the people. And additionally, it teaches us that God is filled with great wrath against the wicked, but he is also faithful in keeping his promises. So let's never forget that there is a balance here. God's, judge, God's judgment is real. God's mercy is real. One doesn't overrule the other. God's judgment will come on people who sin. God's mercy will come on people who repent. And Abraham said God does not destroy the righteous with the wicked. The righteous always are given a way out. The wicked are not. 
Notice Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. Were they righteous or wicked? They were righteous. And what was their way out? How did God provide for them? Well, they trusted in the Lord, but how did God provide for them in the beginning? I'm not talking about the contents of the book of Daniel. It, where they, they weren't destroyed. The, the land of Judah, the, Jerusalem was set on fire. The temple was set on fire, and the people were killed. Yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and others like them were taken into captivity. I'm not saying everyone was taken, who was taken into captivity was righteous, but God provided for them. God was with them. Didn't mean everything that they experienced was good. I'm not saying captivity was great, but you notice that Daniel rose up through the ranks because of his righteousness. But it was because God was with him. Joseph was sold off into Egypt, and yet he became governor of Egypt under Pharaoh. The righteous God is always with the righteous. And bad things might happen to the righteous. And it's not guaranteed that great things are always going to come in the future. But God is always with us. He will provide for us, even if it's not what the wicked receive. So, God's a righteous God. He is always going to keep his promises. And he will return the captives. And so, the last section we'll hear, how does Zephaniah deal, relate to Jesus Christ? And of course, we know we are looking for Jesus Christ in these books of the Old Testament. We know that he is there. Sometimes people stretch how far in the text he is there. But in the minor prophets, he's there. It's undeniable that he's there. And so uh, the question is, how would the following prophecies of Zephaniah be fulfilled in Jesus Christ? And so let's go to Zephaniah 2, verse 11. And we'll get Leister to get that. And we'll get Henry to get Zephaniah 3, 9, and 10. Yeah, Zephaniah 3, 9, and 10. So first of all, Zephaniah 2, verse 11. The land will be forced out to them, for you will be pleased to have the own gods of the earth. People shall worship you, each one from his place, indeed all shores of the nation. All right. I don't remember a verse that, or a passage of scripture that talks about what's being talked about here. I may not remember the exact chapter, but you remember the story? Who was Jesus speaking with? The woman at the well. She asked, Is, we worship God in this mountain. Jews say that we need to worship in Jerusalem. What do you say? And he said, Jesus said, neither in this mountain or in Jerusalem, but every place God will be able to be worshipped. People shall come to worship him, each from his own place, and need each of the shores of the nations. The Gentiles were going to come. The Jews were going to come. And they would worship God together. Even, even other New Testament scripture deals with that. Go ye into all the nations and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All the nations. Go into all the nations. So it, it does signify that the Gentiles would be taken in with uh, and worship God. Bill? Just uh, also the... It will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. There's yeah. a lot of thought there, too. Yeah. None of them gods can save us. Yes, absolutely. Them, you know, been proven over centuries through the Old Testament, they had no power. Yeah. Well, and you even think about, you even think about the Gentiles. They worshipped all of these other gods, the, these Roman gods, these Greek gods. And how many of them came out of idolatry? People in Ephesus burned all their books left their idolatry. And so, even in that, God was showing his power over the idols where people would leave idolatry to serve him. That's a good point. Zephaniah 3, verses 14 to 17, Henry. 14 to 17? Yes, please. Oh. 
Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout of Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, the daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgment and has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your place. You shall see the master of the Lord. In the day it shall be said to Jerusalem, to the field there, that not your hands be weak. The Lord your God is in the midst, the mighty one we are saved. He will rejoice all with you with gladness, he will fight you with his love, he will rejoice all with you with sin. What do we get from that passage? It's going to provide a savior for us. It's going to provide a savior. For them. For them, the Lord God is going to provide a savior. The Lord is going to be in their midst. And so that's ultimately realized in Jesus Christ and his reign here on this earth. Well, here over this earth. He's in heaven, but over this earth today. God reigns. God's going to provide a Savior. So we often think of these other passages that speak about this. Zephaniah is one of these books that does scream loud and clear. Jesus is coming. Now, he doesn't name Jesus. The Messiah is coming. There will be a coming king, a coming savior. The Jews were looking for that savior, and they missed him. But Zephaniah here is in the midst of judgment. He's saying God's going to provide a savior. The Lord God is going to be in your midst and do that. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor 